uh, can wedge in a little prayer for me, that would be appreciated. Father, we just thank you. Lord, whether we are fit, strong, alert, or tired, or weak, sick, you are there with us. Even if we make our bed in the grave, said David, you are there with us. We thank you, Lord. I say, as the hymn writer said, I am weakness, full of weakness. At thy sacred feet I bow. Lord, may you give me strength to preach and people strength to listen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first day of the Jewish Passover begins tonight. And in Israel, it lasts for seven days, other places eight. Biblically, it was seven-day Passover. And so God told the Israelites who were in captivity for 400 years, God raised up Moses and told them that he was going to deliver them. They had to take a spotless lamb, kill that lamb, spread the blood upon the doorposts, on the top, on the two sides. And then when he passed through, it's not the angel of death that passed through, it was God when he passed through. He would smite the firstborn of every household that didn't believe, that didn't obey. Putting the blood on the doorpost was an act of faith and obedience. And we read in Exodus chapter 12, they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts, on the upper door post, and then they shall eat it. Now, they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. That means bread without yeast. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. No yeast. As far as those early Israelites knew... It was just because they had to make haste, they had to gird up their, their loins, their robes, put shoes on their feet, have a staff in their ham, hand, and eat the sacrifice quickly. And so they didn't have time for the bread to rise, and that's really all they knew about it. It was sufficient for them at that time. But in the New Testament, leaven often refers to sin. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, said Jesus, which is hypocrisy. Let us keep the feast without malice and wickedness of any kind, without leaven. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole loaf? We know now that that leaven that they were supposed to get out of the house represented sin. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, says the Apostle Paul, that ye may be a new loaf, as ye are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Christ is the Passover lamb, the sacrifice for us. Purge out the leaven. Today, Jewish people who are really serious about keeping Passover will spend a lot of time before Passover begins, before that first day, searching the house for leaven. Leaven is called hametz in the Hebrew. They will look in their clothes pockets. Maybe I have a crumb, something that had yeast in it. So they will empty their pockets of their shirts, their pants. They will look under the cushions of sofas and chairs. They will look on the closet floor. They will sweep the base of their cabinets. They will clean the stove and the refrigerator and the freezer. And if father happened to be working up in the attic and had his lunch up there, a nice sandwich, they go up there and search for crumbs. Okay. 
We're not under that bondage now. All right. When we think of that very first Passover, 1,200 years B.C., when we think of that first Passover, that first slaying of the lamb, we think of freedom from slavery. We think of deliverance from bondage. We think of victory over oppression and redemption from cruelty. For their bondage was cruel. But what was the purpose of that Passover? Why did God ask them to do that? Why didn't just raise their hand? Yes, I believe God. Why the blood of the lamb? Why God passing over? Well, let me put it this way. The first Passover, the purpose of the first Passover was not to have the Israelites escape and then be caught between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army and complain to Moses that God brought them out there to die. That wasn't the purpose of the first Passover. It was not to have them escape Egypt to Rome in the wilderness for 40 years. That was not why God instituted this first Passover. God did not set them free from slavery so they can look into the promised land, you know, the 12 spies and 10, 10 came back with an evil report saying, oh, it's a nice place to visit, but we don't want to live there. That's not why God brought them. To see the promised land and turn around. He didn't set them free so they could say, you know, surely the promised land flows with milk and honey, but there are giants there and we cannot enter. That was not the purpose of the first Passover. The purpose of the first Passover and probably every Passover after that to remind the Jews it wasn't for them to grow impatient and worship a golden image and subsequently other, other gods. Now the words pass over, two words, two separate words, the words pass over are used many times in Scripture, not referring always to that original Passover, but to just crossing over something, a river or a land or a rock. But I'd like to connect the two uses of the words Passover for a teaching illustration to show us why there was a Passover and also why Christ is our Passover lamb and sacrifice. If we go to Exodus chapter 15, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to that. Exodus 15, verses 13 through 16. I'll give you a moment to find it. Exodus 15. Well, we'll skip over verses 14 and 15. It'll just be 13 and 16 of Exodus 15. Moses says to God, Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people, that's Israel, which thou hast redeemed, thou hast guided them in thy strength, notice now, unto thy holy habitation. He's not talking about the holy mountain Sinai, but that's not where God led them to. He's leading them to the promised land. Verse 16, Fear and dread shall fall upon them, that is your enemies, by the greatness of thine arm, God, they shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over, that's passing over the Jordan River, till the people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. That blood shed by the Lamb was a picture of a purchase as Jesus purchased us with his blood. But what is this holy habitation 
to which God is guiding them. Is it the promised land? No. What does habitation mean? It means dwelling place. It's God's holy dwelling place. Does God dwell in Israel? King Artaxerxes of Persia thought that the God of Israel lived in Jerusalem. He doesn't live in Jerusalem. He didn't live in the Ark of the Covenant. He didn't live in the tabernacle or the temple, though he visited those places. David wanted to make God a home, a habitation. God said, why? Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool and you're going to make me a place? You're going to have me live in a building? What is the holy habitation to which God was leading Israel? It was not the territory. It was not a mountain. What was it? Well, what is the holy habitation of God? Deuteronomy 26, 15. Here is the holy habitation of God. Moses says, look down, praying to God, look down from thy holy habitation, from heaven, and bless thy people Israel, and the land which thou hast given us, as thou swears unto our fathers, a land that flows with milk and honey. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven. God was leading Israel to heaven. You think God just wanted to, to lead them to the promised land and dump them there? No. He wanted to save them. He wanted to redeem them. He wanted them to love Him. Psalm 33, 13. The Lord looks down from heaven. He beholds the sons of men from the place of His habitation. He looks upon all the inhabitants of the earth. And God was not just trying to lead them to heaven and save their souls, but to himself. God wanted Israel, he wants mankind today to make him their habitation. Psalm 91, 9 and 10. Because thou hast made the Lord which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation... You have made, says David, my God, your habitation, your dwelling place, where you live, where you sleep, where you eat. You've made him your habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Into himself. You see, we can't get to heaven unless we make God our habitation. David said in Psalm 71, 3, Be thou my strong habitation. Be my dwelling place. To dwell in Him. To abide in Christ. Our Passover Lamb. So yes, Moses said, Thou hast guided them, your people Israel, in thy strength, for only in God's strength can this be done, unto thy holy habitation. The first Passover was to bring the Israelites to heaven, but by the way of holiness, of separation. We read in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God not only wanted holiness, but demanded holiness from his people Israel, which is separation from sin. That's the purging away, the putting away of all leaven. For them not to worship other gods, for them just to worship him. Remember how the Israelites so quickly went after Baal. He was one of their favorite gods. And that's because he was very ecumenical. Baal would say, you can worship Jehovah, 
And Ashtaroth and me, as long as I'm in the mix there somewhere, that's okay. But God is a jealous God. You cannot worship any other gods. You cannot serve God and mammon. The Passover, that first Passover, the setting free of God's people, was to show them his love, his mercy, his judgment upon idolaters like the Egyptians. And eventually, they themselves. But that first Passover was for them not to be a prey to the enemy, but to go out and conquer. Friends, Jesus Christ has not set us free. If you have been free by the blood of Christ, he hasn't set you free to become prey to the enemy, but to conquer. And if you think Jesus shed his blood just so you could get to heaven, you're thinking wrongly. Exodus 13, 18. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. Armed for battle. And not to lose. Not to lose. Not to be defeated. And you know, Israel was never defeated. Never defeated. When they walked in obedience to God. It was only when they disobeyed God did God allow the enemy to defeat them. The Apostle Paul says, for the weapons of our warfare, now you, if you have been delivered by the blood of Christ, the sac sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb, you have been set free to go out and conquer, to be armed for battle. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, worldly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations. Here is the number one stronghold. Not the crack house. Not the saloon. Our imaginations. What we imagine. Casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing to captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Even the abortion mill is less of a stronghold than our imaginations. Why do you think there is a crack house and a bar where people get drunk and an abortion mill? Because of people's imaginations. What they think they could do and get away with. Evangelist and pastor R.A. Torrey said about prayer being our greatest weapon, it was a master stroke of the devil when he got the church and the ministry, ministry so genuinely to lay aside the mighty weapon of prayer. The devil is perfectly willing that the church should multiply its organizations and its skillfully contrived machinery for the conquest of the world for Christ. Devil says, yeah, you want to go conquer the world? You're armed for battle? Great. Just don't use the weapon of prayer. Go ahead, says Tori. The devil says it will only, if only you will give up praying. If only you will give up praying. Jesus Christ, our Passover, did not shed his precious blood just to forgive us our sin but to make us more than conquerors over sin, to arm us in his, with his holy armor. And we are not to confide in that armor. We do not put our trust in our prayers. We don't put our trust in our biblical knowledge. We don't put our trust in our faith. We put our trust in the God of that faith. We put our trust in the God of that armor. We put our trust in the God of the word, not our knowledge of it, as good as our knowledge is. And so we must go out from our slavery to sin, armed for battle. 
And then we begin to possess what God wants to give us. Deuteronomy 2.24 Rise you up, take your journey and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given into your hand Shion the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Now he says, begin to possess it. Begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. Beginning to possess. The joy the Israelites would have had had they not turned back from going into the promised land. The joy they would have had would have been greater than the joy they had when they were first set free. And what joy they had. It would be greater joy the joy they had as they marched out of Egypt was the beginning of possessing. The beginning could not be compared what was to come later. The joy a sinner feels at conversion when their sins are washed away is just the beginning. Beginning of joy. There's greater joy to come. And I feel sorry for the Christian that says, wow, I had great joy when I was first saved, but now I just have less. <laughs> that, that's not God's problem. That's yours or mine. The joy you feel, the strength you feel, the love that indwelled you when you first put your faith in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin, is just the beginning of possessing the promised land. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. These things I have spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Fullness of joy. You thought you were full of joy when you were first saved, and you were, but you had a very tiny, tiny soul to receive it, to hold it. But as we grow in Christ, we expand okay? and we can have more joy, more strength. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Such love is the fruit of holiness. You know, the, the new life of the believer that begins to flower at conversion, it's just budding. It's just putting forth its leaves, its stalk, flowers it is yet to unfold and to grow into this massive garden of gospel delights now the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing said paul that you may abound in hope the believers of rome are called to abound in hope through the power of the holy ghost and this i pray that your love may abound yet more and more that love you felt for Jesus Christ in the beginning is the beginning of possessing the one who loved us first. The Apostle Paul said, As it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed unto us them unto us by his Spirit." And because he said, God hath revealed them to us by his spirit, he's probably not talking about heavenly things because very little of that has been revealed to us. But when you read the word and study it, you see that God reveals to us that we can have the fullness of God, the breadth, the width, the height, the depth of Christ. It has not yet entered into our hearts. The beginning is good. Progress is even better. John Wesley said, A Christian is one who loves the Lord with his God, with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, and with all his strength. God is the joy of his heart and the desire of his soul, which is continually crying, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth whom I desire besides thee. 
my God and my all. Thou art the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He is therefore, the Christian says Wesley, happy in God, yea, always happy, always rejoicing, even when there's sorrow. As having in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life and overflowing. Right? Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's the overflowing life. When we first start out with Jesus, we think we're overflowing, but we're really just trickling a little bit, just dripping. It's only as we begin to possess and go further and deeper that we begin to flow over. Perfect love now casts out fear. That Christian rejoices evermore. Yes, his joy is full and all his bones cry out, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten me again unto a living hope of an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, reserved for me in heaven. Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, did not shed his blood so that we might begin to experience his life, but to grow into his likeness. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And when you get a taste of it, you're going to want more, hopefully. You're going to want all you can get. So it's not just to be planted in Him, but to grow and flourish in Him. This is what God wanted for Israel. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, said Jesus. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Not only must we be armed for battle we must be ready for battle not everyone who's given a weapon is ready for battle Deuteronomy 3.18 I command you at that time saying the Lord your God hath given you this land to possess it ye shall pass over armed before your brethren the children of Israel again you're going to pass over All that are able for war. Remember Gideon, the farmer whom God called to deliver Israel from the Midianites? He gathered an army of 32,000 men, but they were not all able for battle. 31,700 went home, and he was left with 300. Why? Those 31,000 plus soldiers were not fit for battle. Oh, no doubt they wanted to at first. But they were not fit. They were sent home. David said that God trains his hands for war. You want to go in for those pearly gates into that abundant life that he has here for you below, into his holy habitation. Going to have to fight sometimes to get in there. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend, in some translations say break, a bow of bronze. You know how strong you have to be to bend a bow made out of bronze? Most bows were made out of wood. But those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. How big is your faith? Apostle Paul said, above all, above all the other pieces, giving faith the preeminence, even above the sword of the Spirit. For without faith, no one can please God. Above all, take the shield of faith, 
wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. There were times in my life when my faith was the size of a bottle cap. And you can just imagine how many fiery darts got past that bottle cap. Is your faith like a bottle cap or a huge iron wall? The average Roman soldier was about five foot seven, but his shield was four feet. So it covered most of him. And that brought the Roman legions great success. They hid behind their shields. Historians tell us that every morning when a Roman soldier awakened, the first thing he would go for, not his sword, but his shield. And then he would go for not his sword, but a bottle of oil. And he would take that oil and he would anoint his shield, for the shield was made out of leather. First, the shield. God said to the prophet Isaiah, prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat, drink, arise your princes, and anoint the shield. Make sure your faith is in good order. Make sure your faith is growing. Make sure you're not trusting in your faith. Because then that faith becomes an idol. Make sure your faith is not in yourself, not in your church, not in your good works, but in Jesus Christ alone, in His shed blood, in His Holy Spirit, in His Word. Christ, our Passover, did not sacrifice His life so that we might maintain a small and feeble and withering faith. Apostle Paul said, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. And the love of every one of you has for each other is also increasing. Yes, God gives power to the faint. He increases the strength of those who have no might. And those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And they'll be able, like David, to bend a bow of brass. They will have that supernatural power as Samson did, not in the physical, but in the spiritual realm. We will have that power. When that lion chases us, we'll grab him like Samson did. It was a young lion, not an old feeble lion, not the cowardly lion from the Wizard of Oz. It was a young lion. He tore it like it was a little kid. That's the spiritual power God wants to give us. Why? Why? Because we have enemies that are greater than ourselves. Deuteronomy 9.1 Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. We go armed because we face an enemy that is much greater than than ourselves. He has fortresses fenced up to heaven. But God says, do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God himself will fight for you. We don't have to fear them because we bring the presence of God with us. Why did God have the Ark of the Covenant there that the Israelites carried with them into the promised land? It symbolized the presence of God. Joshua spoke unto the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over the river Jordan before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and they went before the people. The presence of God. We must spend time in the presence of God. In Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan wrote about pilgrim or Christian who was making his way from the city of destruction to the celestial city of heaven. And he went and he put on the armor. And he came out all dressed in the armor of God. But he had to go down a steep hill and he slipped a number of times as all Christians do even when they wear the armor. And he met the enemy of his soul, 
Lucifer, or as Bunyan calls him, Apollyon, as is mentioned, I think, one time in the Bible, Apollyon broke out into a grievous rage against Christians. I am an enemy to this prince of yours. I hate his person, his laws, his people. I am come out on purpose to withstand thee. Apollyon said, Christian, beware what you do, for I am on the king's highway, the way of holiness. Therefore, take heed to yourself. And it was Christian who won the day after a long struggle. But if he was not armed, if he was not prepared for battle, if he was not fit for battle, he would have lost. Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, did not shed his blood that we should live in fear. By this we shall come to know, that is, understand that we are of the truth, and can reassure, quiet, pacify, and rest our hearts in his presence, says the Apostle John. In his presence. So that we might boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Oh, beware, Apollyon, beware, devil. For I am on the king's highway, the highway of holiness. In order for Pilgrim, who was set free when he came to the cross, set free from his huge burden of sin, it fell off his back, rolled into the empty tomb. But in order for him to get to heaven, he had to travel the highway of holiness. Follow peace with all men, says the scriptures, and holiness without which no man shall see God. Holiness, separation from sin. Isaiah speaks of that highway. Isaiah 35, verses 8 and 9. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. In order to get on that highway, you have to be forgiven. You have to be cleansed. You have to be purified. And then you can begin the journey on the highway of holiness. But it shall be for those, the wayfaring man, even the simplest ones, will not lose their way. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. There shall be no lion on that highway. And yet Peter tells the church, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Is that a contradiction? Peter and Isaiah? There's not going to be any lion on that highway of holiness. Peter says, but be sober, be vigilant, because you have an adversary, the devil. The answer is found I think in both Scripture and Pilgrim's Progress. When Pilgrim was making his journey, two men, timorous and matrus, mistrust, came running back, screaming, there are beasts up ahead, there are lions up ahead, they're going to devour us, we're going back. Remember the Apostle Paul said, we're not of those who withdraw unto perdition but believe to the saving of the soul, to the progression. It's not enough to begin, we have to complete. John Bunyan writes, Now before he had gone far, pilgrim that is, he entered into a very narrow passage, which was about a furlong off the porter's house, where he would lodge. And looking very narrowly before him as he went, he espied two lions in the way. Now, thought he, I see the dangers by which mistrust and timorous were driven back by. The lions were chained, however, but Pilgrim did not see the chains. Then he was afraid because he didn't see the chains. He was afraid because he thought maybe those lions can devour me. But they couldn't. He was afraid 
and thought also himself to go back after Timorous and mistrust. For he thought nothing but death was before him. But the porter at the lodge, whose name is Watchful, perceiving that Christian made a halt as if he would go back, cried out to him saying, Is thy strength so small? Fear not the lions. We're not commanded to fear the devil. Fear God, not the devil. Resist the devil. Strike him down. Don't fear him. Fear falling into his temptations. Fear falling into his snares and traps. But don't fear him. He is chained. Perceiving that Christian would turn back, he said, Fear not the lions, for they are chained and are placed there for the trial of faith where it is and for the finding out of those that have none. And here is the key. Yes, we have an enemy, Apollyon, Lucifer, who wants to bring us back into captivity. But he cannot travel on the road called holiness. He can be to the sides. And the porter said to Christian, keep in the midst of the path and no hurt shall come unto thee. No hurt shall come unto thee. Joshua told Israel, be very courageous in going into the promised land. Turn not to the left hand or not to the right hand. Keep down the middle of the road. Keep in the center of God's will. Don't stray. That's where the devil picks off his meals. If you look at those nature programs, you know how the lions are waiting for a calf or even an adult to stray, to get alone, to wander away. Now God has not shed his, Jesus has not shed his blood so that we fear the devil, but rather resist him and conquer over him. Puritan preacher Thomas Watson talked about how the Jews would clean their house of leaven, of yeast, during Passover. He says, this the Jews did before the Passover. And we should search for leaven, that's sin, and having found it, we should burn it. Let us search for the leaven of pride and cast it away. Let us search for the leaven of avarice, greed. Will Christ come into the heart where there is an idol? Search for this leaven before you come to this ordinance, referring to the Lord's table. How can an earthly heart converse with, what, with that God which is a spirit? Can a clod of earth kiss the sun? Search for the leaven of hypocrisy and burn it. The Holy Spirit, God's word, is like a fire. Yes, purge out the old leaven that ye may be a new loaf. Now he's talking about individuals in the congregation that are troublemakers and evil and fornicators, and wicked people. Purge them out. Excommunication. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, but it also applies to our own hearts. Therefore let us keep the feast. And he could be referring to this feast here. Not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We're going to partake of this ordinance. Just a minute. I'm going to again, as I have done in times past, read a few lines from one of John Wesley's songs. To the supper of the Lord... Gladly we will come today. The word of peace is now restored. The old leaven is put away. Christ will be our food alone. 
Faith, no life, but his will own. Hallelujah, says John Wesley. The old leaven is put away. Why? Because Christ has put it away. So that sin shall no longer have dominion over us. If something is so entrenched in us that we cannot get rid of it in Christ's name, and there's something wrong with our relationship because he defeated the devil. He defeated sin. So we should be able to put away all the leaven from our lives, to cast off the works of darkness. Little by little, possess the promised land. The land that flows with the beauty of the Lord Jesus. Let me close in prayer now and then we'll take communion. Well, we thank you that you have set us free from our bondage to sin. Not to get stuck. Not to wander. Not to lose battle after battle. Not to fear. But to conquer. To be fruitful and multiply, as you told Adam. To dress the garden and keep it. To watch over it. Well, that's why you set us free. That's why the blood sprinkled upon the doorposts of our hearts is not only so important but powerful. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood. That power is still available today to make us more than conquerors. Through Him that loved us, says the apostle. And where did the Lord Jesus show his love in the greatest way and dimension but on the cross? And that's where we get the power to be more than conquerors. Lord, you've set us free to travel the highway of holiness so that the devil is kept at a safe distance from us. And we hear him roar, we can feel the heat of his breath and his foul stench. But yet, Lord, we know we're safe if we travel in the middle of the road and do not turn to the right or to the left. Help us, Lord, to understand what this poor preacher is trying to show his people. And now, Lord, we look to that sacrifice of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.